The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, episode 589. The best from 10 years ago, 2009. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Tom previews our upcoming Kickstarter campaign. We hear a tale of horror from an unexpected source, and we scour the mailbag to answer questions about upgrading and updating games, how to avoid playing a game that makes you ill, and how Tom and I explain ourselves at parties. Then we turn back the clock to 2009 for our top 10 games from 10 years ago. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Sherlock to my homes, Tom Vassell. Are, are, are you referring to this really bad movie? What, the, the Guy Ritchie one with, uh, with Iron Man in it? No, no. Oh, oh, you're going back to 2009. You realize there was a Holmes and Watson movie that just came out over Christmas. Yeah, I'm not talking about that one. No, no. That no. one got like... A 3% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, then, uh, yes, that doesn't exist. <laughs> what, the Sherlock Holmes movie came out a decade ago? Yeah, the the original, or not original, but uh, yeah, the uh, the first Guy Ritchie-directed uh, um, Robert Downey Jr. vehicle. You know, I didn't really like that one that much. It was I didn't, odd. It was fun. I didn't dislike it, I guess, in that it's fun. It's just that it did what... Like the new James Bond movies, it, it didn't feel like the classic story. Like, this didn't feel like Show X Holmes. Hmm. It just felt like a really smart superhero type guy. A guy who, you know, could suddenly look at all the numbers and figure out where the guy's going to punch next. That's not Sherlock Holmes to me. Right. He Sherlock was much Holmes more of a brawler. Yeah. And I don't know. And that's fine. It wasn't the movie was bad. It just wasn't what I was looking for. Right. I think, I, I mean, I prefer Benedict Cumberbatch. As, as Sherlock Holmes's go. You know, I still need to watch more of those, I think. Oh, they're all very good. Yeah. Well, either way, folks, welcome to the show. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. So this is a, a, an interesting show. We are recording this a little bit early, but in a, f- in a week, or less than a week, six days, we're going to be launching the Dice Tower Kickstarter. Hmm. Now, the Dice Tower is sponsored by people like you. If you're listening to the show, we do not charge for, for our shows or anything. We just have a fundraiser on a website called Kickstarter. We do that once a year in January. Usually, we start earlier in January, but just because of logistics and things, we're starting a little bit later. We're going to run it for three weeks, and it's going to start at noon Eastern Standard Time on January 21st. So, the Dice Tower is two main sections. There is the video YouTube section, and then there's Eric and me and Mandy and Suzanne doing the audio section. And we, I, I want to say we put out 50 episodes a year or so. I think we miss a week or two. Yeah, or, it's it's uh, well, a little more rare. Now that we have um, all four of us, we can sort of replace each other, and it's rare that all four of us are busy at the same time. I think we did take a couple weeks off this year. Sure, but we try to be as consistent as we possibly can, get the shows coming out on, on Tuesday. And then on the video side of thing, of course, we review, try to review every board game under the sun. Uh, also, you know, we just have various other things that we do. We go to conventions, we cover conventions, we run our own conventions. We're always trying to improve, we're always trying to make things better. And so we ask that if you think that that's worth it if you think that that deserves some of your money then go check out our kickstarter not only that if you do back our kickstarter we have some pretty nifty little rewards and things promos from games and we're introducing our new mascots the dice animals what Uh, so yeah they look really cool and so we have lots of different ways to get them and we have some new uh different items that we haven't had in past years we have dice bags which seems kind of like something we should have had a long time ago Sure. Um, but we got dice bags. We have uh, sleeves for games with our logos on them. And we got some cool plastic containers because I'm always raving about them. So we might as well have them 
on our sh- on, on our Kickstarter. Cool. So one of the things that people ask about this is where the money goes for the Dice Tower. And it goes into running the Dice Tower. We have a Dice Tower studio. Uh, we have salaries for me and my full-time employees and part-time employees. Uh, but then again, don't forget, Kickstarter takes a cut of that money. Uh, the we pay for a lot of the supplies. We pay for travel and conve- and equipment. And I, I promise you, good folks, I I do my best to make those dollars stretch and make the dice tower better every year. So over the past year, we've done a lot of different changes, but we tried to settle into a sort of routine with the dice tower podcast. And 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 for this show, folks, I'm kind of specifically talking about the podcast. Um. Our goal for this year is to just make this show better. Eric and me are going to sit down and talk about it. We've been doing kind of the same thing for a while. And don't worry, we're not planning on revitalizing the show or doing anything. And, and Manny and Suzanne are going to be doing stuff with their show and so on. But, you know, we want to make this a better podcast. We'd love to hear back from you. You know, if you have uh, ideas and things that could make the show better, send those to us at, um, uh, let me see, uh, at Tom at Dicetower.com. I love to hear feedback on how we can make the show better, new segments and things you would like to see, but we like to keep the core of it the same. We want to be something that you can faithfully listen to each Tuesday, and we really do like doing the top 10 lists and stuff, and I, I think that you know, we'll, me and Eric will just try to work on those and make those as good as we can this year. We're going to be at different conventions. We're going to be at some conventions with a bigger presence than we've ever been to before, but we're also doing some more of our own conventions. We have Dice Tower West. That we'll both be going to in a, in a month or so. Just a couple months, yeah. Yeah, and then Dice Tower Con and the Dice Tower Retreat. We're going to be messing with that and changing that up a little bit. And we'll be giving out information on these as we go by. And I don't want to keep talking about this over and over. I'll mention it in the next couple uh, shows possibly. But if you, this is something you're interested in, you just check out the Dice Tower Kickstarter. If you want to find an easy link to it, just go to our website, Dicetower.com, and there will be a link right there on the front page. And if you can't support us, that's fine. We don't think that people who can't support us are any worse than those who do. Uh, spread the word. Tell other people. Put it on Twitter. Put it on Facebook. Tell other folks. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. All I have to say is thank you. Well, yes, that's true. We really do appreciate everybody. And again, this is a show that's funded by you all. The vast majority of our funding comes from you guys, and we want to make it the best show that we possibly can. So with that being said, let's talk actually about board games. Eric, what do you got for us? Uh, So I got to play this uh, this little gem at the Dice Tower Retreat. It's called Arayel. Uh, It's a Portuguese-themed Tetris game. Uh, The the theme is all about, like, a a dance. You're trying to get dancers into a town square, but really, it's Tetris. Uh, You have pieces that will be available. (laughs) It is. Uh, You have have your grid, uh, your your play space, and you have certain pieces that represent these dancers in various crazy poses. The the illustrations are are very – they're very very cartoony, but they're also adorable. Um, And you'll have three of these on sort of a turntable available at any given moment. Uh, And you can spend – you have three actions. You can spend an action to drop a piece, but you can also spend an action to rotate the entire turntable because when you drop one of the pieces, they drop in the orientation that they are on the turntable. Uh, So if it's not in the orientation you want, you need to rotate them to get them to drop properly. You can slide them around uh, as you you drop them. You can actually do the little Tetris thing where you take like an L piece – and stick it into a into a little uh, cave uh, on the lower level. You're trying to make groupings of the same color. There are four different colors, uh, and the larger the grouping is, you sort of battle for a majority of who has the largest, like blue group. They get a special double meeple. Um, but you also are trying to get smaller groupings of these things in order to collect as many meeples, scoring meeples, as possible. But you're also trying to pack as well as you can because if you get too far up your your board and cross a certain line, uh, you will stop earning certain bonuses and and you don't want that. Uh, So so you have to build um, efficiently, also create Full lines, which will increase your your bar, your um your your level that you can uh, fill your your board with. Um, it's sort of like in Tetris when you would get a complete line, it would disappear. Effectively, it's the same thing. 
Uh, Mandy and Suzanne talked about this uh, at length a few episodes back, so I won't go into too much more detail, except to say that I really enjoyed it. It's a it's a lovely Tetris analog. It's it's cute. It's entertaining. It plays quickly. I I really enjoyed Arayal. Thumbs up. Yeah, this is a, a one of the simplest versions of those, um, you know, Tetris style games, and this is, I think, easily the most close to Tetris. Mm-hmm. I've seen some people complain that you just kind of there's a lot of luck involved with the game, and I think there's a little bit of truth to that. But I, I think it's so much fun. I don't, I don't care. Sure, I mean, if the, if you get like the exact right piece that comes out at the right time, yes, you could certainly. Um you know, make out like a bandit. But that doesn't happen that often. All right, I'm going to talk about a game that you may not have heard of called Wingspan. (laughs) This is from small indie publisher Stonemaier Games. (laughs) 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 Ah, There was so much talk about this. We had it at the retreat, but we had to, like, swear everyone to not talk about it and play. Did Did you play it? I didn't get a chance to play it. I hovered and watched for a few minutes, but I didn't get a chance to play. So this is kind of a fascinating thing to me. So Wingspan is a completely, I believe it's the designer's first game. It's a whole new set of people designing it, but has the Stonemaier uh, super production values. And it's a game about birds. Now, I'm kind of fascinated by the number of people when we talk about this, and they're like, what a boring theme. And I'm just a little surprised at that because I think birds are kind of interesting. I mean, I don't sit down and study them all the time, but... Different birds. It's refreshing to see like a new theme. Yeah, and, it's different. And, and board gaming. So in this game, you're collecting birds in front of you, and you're basically building a tableau of birds in three different habitats. And the game comes with 170, it's 170, 160, something like that, different bird cards. Every single card is different. Wow. And there are all these different North American birds, which leads me to the supposition that we will see like a South American birds and a African birds, you know, expansion. Sure. Why not? And you're going to be playing these birds. You're going to take eight actions on round one, then seven, then six, and five. So you're taking these different actions. And the action that you take might be playing a bird in front of you, which will cost food. And, or the action might be laying eggs on birds. You put eggs on birds, which will make these birds worth more points. Or the action might be to get more cards in your hand that – well, you play more birds, or the action might be to uh, get food, which is what you need to put the birds out in the first place. And all these different actions are modified by the birds that you have out there. So the more birds you get out there, you might take an action, and you might get a few other minor sub-actions because they, they're modifying that main action. Not to mention the main action gets stronger and better the more birds that you have. So if I have a lot of water habitat birds, for example, then every time I draw cards, I might – Instead of drawing just a couple cards, I might be drawing three cards by the end. And so it's a really neat kind of engine-building style game that's fairly light uh, in how it, it's put together but offers a lot of good meaty choices. I would compare it to Race for the Galaxy. Although, I mean it's not quite Race for the Galaxy, but it's in that kind of bucket of games. And I think people are really going to like it because there's not a lot of – difficulty in understanding how the game works you have these birds you're trying to get the right foods to put the birds out you put these birds out uh birds are worth a certain amount of points so you might want to put out some big point birds or maybe smaller point birds but then get a bunch of eggs on them and then there's also goals that everybody's trying to get to and you might have some secret goals that you are trying to accomplish it's fairly straightforward but amazing components there's little wooden eggs in it that look like candy (laughs) Uh, this was the oddest game at the Dice Hour Retreat, probably. That partially might be because it was a new game that no one had seen. Right, it was secret. Mm. Right, but everyone who played it seemed to like it, and some people kept coming back and asking to play it over and over again. Okay. Uh, I really think this game is, is going to do extremely well. I'm really happy with the theme. The drawings look like they're John Audubon style. Hmm. And it, it it's just a very – it's pleasant – a good word, I think, maybe. It's just a, such a pleasant game. Right. You know, every once in a while I come across a theme where I'm like, yeah, this is the kind of theme that even those people who are like, you are playing orcs? I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> I can bring this by and be like, hey, you want to look at some birds? And they could get into it. 
Okay. And I think that I think that's interesting because you know a lot of the themes that I like can be nerdy. You know, space, fantasy. Even trading in the Mediterranean isn't something that's going to necessarily appeal to some folks, but the birds I think has a very broad appeal and this is a pretty cool game, so maybe this game will sneak into places that other games don't get into. Yeah. That's Wingspan from Stonemeyer Games. Hmm. By the time you hear this episode, I bet Eric has played it. Wow. Could be. Uh, one game that I have really been wanting to play for some time is Nyctophobia. This this made a splash at Gen Con, but I just hadn't had a chance to play it until uh, the retreat just a few weeks ago. I think ago. you should do this review with your eyes closed. I Okay, I will, just for the heck of it. Except I want to open my eyes to get the designer's <laughs> name right. <laughs> Um, this is from a first-time designer named Catherine Stipple, uh, and, and she designed this to play with, is it her father or grandfather, who is blind, visually impaired. Uh, she wanted to play a game that would simulate being blind, and, and this game is played with blinders on. You've got these blackout sunglasses, and it's played with the sense of touch. It is a cooperative, one versus many, hunt game, like a, a hide-and-seek sort of game. The uh, players, the, the hunted players, are trying to find a car in a forest board. And the forest is represented, it's a grid, and you've got these pieces that are pointy plastic pieces that represent trees, they're barriers. So you've made this maze. Um, and what happens is that everyone puts on these glasses, and then the hunter player, the, the one person, uh, then sets up the maze. So everyone just sits there, like, talks awkwardly for a little while while this person sets up the maze. Because once you start setting it up, you can't look at the board anymore. But anyway, you've got these pointy pieces that represent the walls of the maze. There is also a, a car piece that has a very distinctive uh, shape and feel that sits on two spaces in here. And then each player has a cylindrical piece with a distinctive shape on the top that is their piece. Uh, and on your turn, your you hold out your finger, and the uh, the hunter player will guide your finger to your piece, and you can move around the board and feel the spaces that are next to you to see where there are trees, where there are other objects. There's some rock tokens that you can pick up to throw at the hunter if if they come and get you. Uh, and then after every couple of movements, the hunter player is going to get to move. It's all card based, and they are trying to track down the uh, the hunted players. And if they manage to tag them twice, any one of the players twice, before the good guys find the car and call for help and survive a turn, then the the hunter wins. Um, I played I win. this. You, it means you, murders. Yes. Uh, I played this both as the hunted player and as the hunter. Um, and this is it, it's it's entertaining for sure. I, I enjoyed the feeling. It's very different to be sort of in your own head and trying to feel the board as you as you uh, escape from the bad guy. And um, it's also fun to sort of taunt the players and uh, and and draw them in the wrong direction and and laugh at them while they they are flailing about in the dark. Um, it is a little fiddly. Um, it. Because it does these things in such an interesting and different way, uh, I, I, I can forgive that just a little bit. It's such a unique game. Um, right. But it is, it, it's, you know, the, the pieces sometimes get a little loose as the players are fiddling around. You have to be gentle as you feel because you can actually knock a, uh, a tree out of the way um, or, or miss the fact that there's a tree and start exploring over, you know, jumping the hedge when you aren't allowed to. Uh it's a little bit to keep track of. There's there's instructions for the uh, the hunter player to sort of taunt the the players, um, and depending on how you do that, it's sort of up to the hunter to increase the experience a little bit and almost not be too good at the game, uh, because if you are playing to your utmost and the players are flailing around, you will probably win. Um, and then there's there's also a magic user player. There's 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 two different hunters in the game. There's one that's just like a regular axe murderer, and then there's like a witch or a magician that actually can rotate the board and move walls and stuff. Do not play that with new players. Um, I didn't realize that that was who I was going to be and what the, what was going to happen. I felt terrible rotating the board and moving walls when they had no idea what was going on. Uh, I think that's a much more advanced sort of game. Anyway, I enjoy it. 
I don't think this is one I'm going to seek out, but I have to give them mad props for doing something that is unlike any other game I've played. It's almost theater of the mind. So, yes, thumbs up for Nyctophobia, but it's not one that I'm going to seek out a copy of myself. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. The, the game has such a cool... Uh, you know, premise and it, it it works on one level. My my problem is, I think that the you it should have just said straight up in the front. Well, it did kind of, but you you really need to go in that the person who's being the bad guy almost needs to be a dungeon master. Because mm-hmm. if he just if he just plays like like if he's one of those guys who like tries to you know win by hundred points in a euro game, he's going to win this game. Right. Well, I mean, you have to be the 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 facilitator in one sense because you're the only one that can see and you're pointing the players where they need to go. You're answering rules questions. You need to run the game in addition to being the bad guy. Uh, so that's that's just well, sort sure, of in but the. Could, but but in a role playing game, I assume most game masters aren't there to destroy the dungeon groups. Right. Yes, and it does say that in the rules that that you're well, there no, to says, make the experience. It work. kind of it kind of like says it in a mild way <laughs> i don't know i don't know but i mean it's it's just too easy to destroy the 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 people running if you want to i agree all right well let's talk about new frontiers have you heard of this game eric uh yes i have this is the new rio grande right this is yeah the actual the subtitle is the race for the galaxy board game well yes so New Frontiers is, I would say, 66% Race for the Galaxy and 33% Puerto Rico. I'm listening. That's the review. Oh. <laughs> no, there's there's more to it than that. And, and some of you listening are going, uh, we've never played either of those games. Whew. Well, uh, you you can still learn this. It's it's you know Melody has did not play either of those games, and I was able to teach this game to her. And then I'd say most of the people I've taught it to, though, probably knew Race for the Galaxy. It really is Race for the Galaxy, the board game. And it's very rare to see a card game become a board game. Usually it's the other way around. Hmm. Uh, but in New Frontiers, each of you, each player is building an empire of space, you know, space planets and things like that. You'll start with one planet. And then each turn of the game, One of the players goes first, and you go around the table, and they're going to pick an action. There are several tiles with actions to pick on the table. This is the part that's like Puerto Rico. Yep. You pick that action, and everyone will take that action, but the person who picks the action will get a bonus. So, for example, you might pick buy a technology, and everyone gets to buy a technology. They'll pay some credits, some money that comes with the game for technologies, but the person who picks the tile, not only do they get to buy their technology first, but they also get a discount of one when buying it. In this game, all the technologies are stacked up in the middle of the table, hmm. and there's there there's some technologies that are in every game, and there's some technologies that there's in 50% of the games. A lot of the technologies are double-sided, so those, some will be in some games and not other games. Uh, so you can buy these technologies, and they're going to make your actions better usually. They might say, when buying a technology, you get $2 discount or what have you. Hmm. You can also explore planets in this game. So you'll draw planets from a bag, and then each player is going to be adding planets to their queue. These planets are all different types. And then once you've explored the planets, you can settle them. Some planets can be settled. uh, Some trade planets can be settled by basically paying money to settle them. Others need to be conquered militarily, and you'll need a certain military power to do that. And you get military by getting some planets that give you military and some technologies give you military. And then there's a few other things you can do. Some of the planets produce goods. You can sell these goods for money uh, or sometimes trade these goods in for victory points. Planets and technologies, both of them when you build them are worth victory points. And you can also collect victory points from selling your different goods you make. There is many, many, many different ways to play. You can play a... Someone who just gets a big military and conquers a bunch of worlds. You can play someone who produces a lot of goods and sells those goods for a lot of points. You can be, play someone who just settles a lot of worlds and makes a lot of technologies and just get a lot of points that way. So, so far, I bet if you're listening to this, you are saying that sounds exactly like Race for the Galaxy. That sounds just like Race for the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah. So what are the differences? And this, if you've not played Race for the Galaxy, I apologize. But 
So the differences are in Race for the Galaxy, you you are hoping to find the cards that you need from the deck. Mm-hmm. You will probably get some, and your starting hand will help determine the direction that you take. But in this game, Space Marines, which gives you plus two military, for example, is in every game, and it's right there, and I can buy it on turn one. Always. Okay. Yeah, okay. So there's a little bit more of a set. You can do certain things. The planets are still going to be random when you pull them, but the technologies are on the board, and so you can kind of focus on that. Also in this game, in in Race for the Galaxy, the neat thing was that cards were goods and cards were money. In this game, money is actually – there's money in the game, and there's actually goods. By the way, they're really cool, like crystal cube-type goods. They're really cool crates that you put on the planets. And so you have these different currencies that you have to deal with, and money can be tight, and you want money because you can buy these really big technologies. There's a bunch of technologies on the table that, you know, can give you a whole lot of victory points if you meet, you know, they might say, uh, you get points for every green planet you have. Well, then you better get a lot of green planets for that one to work. Basically, the six point developments. That's correct, except here they usually cost nine credits. Okay. So I like it a lot, actually. I think that the components are neat. I think there's a lot of cool options. I like Puerto Rico and Race for the Galaxy. Uh, I think it offers enough differences between this and Race for the Galaxy that I would play them both. I don't know that it will pass Race for the Galaxy for me, or Roll for the Galaxy, for that matter, hmm. uh, because Race is so fast. I can set up Race and go, boom, 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 let's play, and I can get through a game of Race for the Galaxy in 20, 30 minutes. Now, playing with experienced people, real life. Right, yeah. But a two- or three-player game race for the Galaxy, I can really hammer those out. And I play it on my iPad all the time. I can play a lot of race for the Galaxy, and it's really easy to do. This is going to take a while because it's a much bigger footprint on the table. There's boards and planets and technologies, and they got to be put in the right spots. Uh, is it better than Puerto Rico? I... See, that's the thing. I think it's a mixture of Race for the Galaxy and Puerto Rico, but I don't think it's better than either one of those. But that's not a knock against it either. I think it's a nice combination between them. Hmm. This is the fourth game in the Race for the Galaxy universe. We start with Race for the Galaxy, which is an amazing game. And then Roll for the Galaxy, which initially I liked better than Race, but as time has gone by, it's dropped slightly, although I still like both of them quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Jump Drive which was like a beginner's race for the galaxy, and I was, nah, whatever. But it's actually a pretty fun little game, and then now we have New Frontiers. Okay. I own all four of them, so go figure. Huh. It's a huge box. It does fit in a calyx shelf, so <laughs> barely, but it's bigger than your Ticket to Ride size box. But overall, I, I, I enjoyed this one a lot, and I think if you like Race for the Galaxy, you will also enjoy this. That's oh. New Frontiers. All right. It's just, I mean, not that this wasn't already on my list of games to check out, but now it's its still there. Last for I me think... today is a game that I also had been wanting to play for some time, uh, Too Many Bones. Now, I thought for some reason this was a pirate game, but it's not. <laughs> it, it does sound like one. I just thought, you know, Too Many Bones, just I thought the skull and crossbones every time I heard that title. But, um... It is a dungeon crawl game that uses dice as its primary mechanism. And the dice, depending on what character you have, can represent all sorts of different things. Uh, You get this mat, this player mat, with slots for all these dice. And I think there are 16 possible dice for your character. I played a, a guy with a mech that was a steam powered mech. And so some of the, one of the dice was uh, like one of the steam tanks. And uh, I had to roll it every turn and see if I lost steam that turn. And um, then there are various weapons that I could draft into my pool and, uh, and, and different categories of drones that I could add to my, my character. But you might have a totally different one that uses other weapons and spells and all sorts of dice. But basically, it's all these dice. And when you have an encounter, uh, you you will choose which of these dice to roll. There are basic attack dice and uh, there's defense dice, but you can also do these spells or actions or drones or whatever your character rolls, uh, which all have, you know, every character plays totally differently. 
Um, but the, the, the joy of this game and why I really liked it is the customization of this character because you don't have all those dice when you first start. You spend training points after you successfully complete a mission or do some sort of task and you'll spend points to add to your character, add dice, add defense, add more ability to do stuff on your turn. Um, and you could develop in totally different ways based on your your whim or or where you want to head. I mean, if you're a beginner, they give you some some hints. Uh, you might want to get more health right off the bat. But you can go in whatever direction you want, and, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, and it'll play differently than the last time you played. I really enjoyed the game. Uh, we, we failed just on the last boss playing the game, but it was still a joyous experience. Would I buy it, though? I mean, there is a lot in here, and the, the folks I played it with had both core sets plus a few expansions and promo characters and stuff, and there was a lot in there, and it's all d- done with these chips. This is the, the group that did Hoplomachus uh, several years ago that also used chips to represent a character's health as you move them around the board. Similar system here, much more simplified grid, though, for moving around and doing your battles. There, it's it's a heavy box. There's a lot in there. I almost feel like I'd get lost. Like I would never be able to explore this game to its potential. So while I would enjoy playing this one again, this is not one I need to own, uh, and and it's not one that I think my kids would enjoy either. So I'm I'm gonna back away. I can check this off my must own list, but I wouldn't mind another game or two of Too Many Bones. You know, I think that's a reasonable, you know, conclusion to come to. I, I like the game a lot, but I, I certainly understand that, right? It's there's a lot going on in it, and it's a game you can appreciate and have a lot of fun with. But it's also a game that when you put on the shelf to pull it back off, you're like, "All right, how does that play again?" <laughs> Unless you're continuing to play it over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, it's it's campaign based, so I, I'm sure you'd be working your way through, um, you know, various bad guys and story elements and stuff. I, I just don't think it's one that I'd be able to tackle. It would it would be lower on the list of campaign games for me to play. Right. All right. The last game I want to talk about is Coin and Crown. This is from Escape Velocity Games. And it is a game where you're basically fighting over an ancient civilization. You're trying to capture these different hamlets and towns and villages and cities. And you're doing so with a – what is essentially a bag-building game, except it's a money-building game. In this bag, you have uh, copper, silver, and gold coins, and you pull them out. You pull out some each turn, and you're going to use those to do different actions, buying things usually – and then you can get more coins and throw them in the bag. So it's kind of an interesting – just you're spending money to do things. And there's three different rows, and the first row is cards that are bought with copper coins. The second is coins that – cards bought with silver coins and so on. So you buy these different cards. Some of them are military cards, which lets you attack villages and, and cities to capture them, which gives you the points. You can also get resources and just – You know, basically buy these places and then grow them into the cities that you want them to be. And then there's cards that give you special abilities. Meanwhile, you're fighting over everything in a sense of whoever has the most soldier cards gets a crown that's worth some points. Whoever has the most mines gets, you know, the mine crown, which is worth a certain amount of points. Hmm. So it's like the battle for the longest road in Catan, except there's like eight of them. And it really matters because all these points, there's not a ton of points in the game. So most of the points are going to be coming from controlling these cities and villages that you are getting, but also from competing back and forth between these. It's, it's, it's interesting. It feels like a lesser race for the galaxy, a lesser dominion type thing. But put together, it's not bad. It's only about 45 minutes. It's very Spartan in how it looks. Think um, the uh, – what's that civilization card game? By Chris Seslick? Uh Seslick. Innovation? Innovation. It looks like the first innovation. Right. Carl Chudik. Carl Chudik, right. Yeah. Chris, Chris Seslick is, is the publisher. But same thing. Asmati Games, it looks like that. The box doesn't. The box is, like, beautiful. But once you look at all the cards, there's, like, silhouettes of the stuff. It's very Spartan in its look. I would prefer it to look a little nicer, but it's functional for what it is. 
I like it. That's coin and crown. Neat. Well, let's pause here in sadness. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Narrator. What? Uh, can I tell this one? Oh, yes, sure, of course. <laughs> I don't I don't have the, uh, the uh, gravitas that you do, but I would like to tell my own tale of horror as it's just happened, and it made me nearly weep. Well, not nearly weep, but it was sad, and it was actually scary. Anyway, the point of the matter is I hate Ford. So <laughs> Ford. <laughs> okay. Now, listen, that's... That's part of the tail heart. This is a, this is a port. So Ford, uh, there's a dealership in the area, and we've had some problems with our van, and so we took the the van in, and they charged me an obscene amount of money and said they fixed the problems. So I trusted that these problems were fixed. Now, I do a lot of different events, and I take a lot of games to events, but there's one game that I take to all the major events because that's pretty much the only place I play this game, and in fact, I consider myself to be the world grandmaster referee of this game. Pitch car. That is correct. Pitch Ooh. car. I've spent years putting this pitch car collection together. Uh, you know, it's not that it's that big of a deal, but I have multiple sets, multiples of every expansion, all the different cars, and it's just something that I run all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I ran it at a church event or – yeah, I ran it at a church event. So I took it there because it's pitch car. When we got home, I was tired and decided to go in the house and leave it in the back of the van and not really worry about it too much. Well, the reason we had taken our van to Ford was because when it rains, water would leak into the van. Oh, no. Yeah, so water, like I said, that leak was not fixed. So it rained, but it didn't rain. It Florida rained. Oh, which no. Which if you've ever been in Florida, you know that that's basically like being in the shower. Uh-huh. And water poured into the entire thing of pitch car. I didn't realize that's what had happened. And someone said, hey, pitch car got left in the back of the van and it rained. And I said, oh, the boards got wet. You know, just bring them inside and let's dry them off. Uh-huh. They were brought inside uh, and just left in the bin for uh probably 48 hours. Oh, no. While other things went on. You know, Christmas and New Year's and all that stuff's going on. Uh-huh. So I was like, all right, let's get pitch car out and look. Well, water and wood. Mm -mm. Would you know? Or plywood, probably. Water mm -hmm. and plywood do not work well together. <laughs> no. It, it sounds like you had a tub full of oatmeal when you were done. Yeah. So the good news is, you know those little plastic dividers? <laughs> oh, those, those are great. <laughs> oh, no. They're fine. Yeah, I lost my whole pitch car collection, with the exception of the very long boards oh, that I have, the long straightaways. Because they're in plastic. No, they just were in a different part of the van. Oh, man. And the cars, I think, are fine. Ugh. Because they are treated wood. Right. Oh, no. Everything else was one big, soggy, sopping mess. I said, uh, but lo and behold, I'm running a pitch car event on the cruise. Now, I've been able to recoup part of my collection. I have the, I have some base sets of uh, pitch car. I got a couple of the expansions, the biggest one being getting that jump because the jump is the thing everybody loves. Right. But yeah, whew, at least I hadn't got my Kickstarter stuff yet. I had, I backed it on Kickstarter for the loop. The loop, stuff. yeah. But it made me sad. You know, I don't normally – people always say that I treat my games with disrespect, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not like that tied to games. A game is a game. It's if you lose it. But I've had Pitch Car since the game came out. <laughs> right. Uh, it's also so, one that's been used. I mean it's one that's getting a lot of use and it has a, a tremendous amount of utility for you. And now you can't do that. Yeah. Well, I mean like I said, with the help of some friends and some stuff, I'm getting it. I'm still like looking for four of the expansions. It's not so easily available, you know. Right. Because pitch card goes in and out of print all the time. Well, I'll eventually get everything back together. Still, though. Whew. Yeah. Now, now you have things to shop for at conventions. That was my tale of horror. You have to do the laugh. Oh yes. 
<laughs> I can't, Eric. You do it for me. <laughs> you actually seem to be enjoying this. Uh, I mean, no. Oh, sorry. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. In the last Game Tech, I talked about testing that I did on the Popomatic. Does the die behave like a normal die or something else? Now, thanks to the holidays, that episode aired a while ago now, so a quick recap of the results. Normally, you expect each note to come up about a sixth of the time, 17% or so. In my 265 pops, the numbers range from a low of 14% for the 2 to a high of 20% for the 3. So, does that mean that the pop is good or not? Now, of course, you'd never expect a die to roll each number exactly one-sixth of the time. There's going to be some variation around that. But how do you, as an experimenter, know if what you're seeing is normal variation, or if it means that a 3 in this case is really more likely to come up? Now, one way is to repeat the experiment, pop the pop a a lot more times. If I do another 265 pops and again, three comes up 20% of the time, well, that's starting to give me a hint that there may be something going on. In general, getting more data is the best way to reduce uncertainty. That's related to why games where you roll tons of dice actually have less luck in them, which I've talked about before. But let's say you can't just get more data. Let's say experiment is really hard and expensive to perform or was a transient event or your mom stole your pop What do you do then? Are you just stuck? Well, during the 19th century, mathematicians were wondering the same thing. And the field of statistics came into full flower. A variety of tests were developed to be able to look at your data and see what's going on. The simplest that you can perform is called a chi-squared test. Now, before I get to that, let me define an important term, the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the baseline of what is expected if nothing funny is going on. For example, with our Popomatic test, the null hypothesis is that a number will appear one-sixth of the time. If you're testing whether exposure to a chemical is related to a disease, the null hypothesis is that there is no relation that a person has exactly the same chance to get the disease whether or not they are exposed to the chemical. Now the chi-squared test, and really all statistical tests, look at the data and let you know how far away the results are from what you would expect. Is it improbable that you got that result, or is it not that strange? So with our pop we have our null hypothesis, and we have our data. What does the chi-squared test tell us? Well, in the case of my data, it says that it's not significantly different than the null hypothesis. Now, the output of these statistical tests is a probability. The chance that the result differs from the null hypothesis to a real effect and not just random chance. But in this case, the chance that the number distribution is far off from the normal 1-6 chance per side is small. The initial data shows, the chi-squared shows, that my popomatic data is pretty normal from what you expect from any kind of standard die. Now, I also presented pair data. If I roll a 2, does it change the chances of what I roll next? And in this case, I did observe an effect. If I rolled a 2, there was a much greater chance that I would roll a 5 next time, like a 40% chance. So my intuition, and looking at the graphs I put together, told me that this was unlikely to just be a random occurrence. But what did the statistics say? Well, several helpful listeners ran the numbers. They calculated something called the p-factor. P is, roughly speaking, a measure of the probability that the result you got is just random and that the null hypothesis is actually correct. Now, to my fellow stats nerds out there, I know this isn't strictly true, but I think it's a good way to think about it. Now, in this case, with this data, the p-value was 0.005. That means, basically, that there's a half percent chance that the null hypothesis is correct and a 99.5% chance that there's something else going on. This, in an experiment, would be a very strong and significant p-result. In standard scientific experiments, the accepted criteria for a significant result is a p-value of 0.05, or a 95% chance that the null hypothesis is false. There's nothing magic about this number. There's just general agreement that this is a reasonable threshold for significance. 
Now, there is actually a problem right now in scientific research, particularly in the areas where cause and effect are hard to determine, like toxicity measurements, social sciences, and other messy subjects. Now, the problem is that using 5% as a target level means that one out of every 20 results is not actually a real result. It's just attributable to the researcher getting unlucky. Now, this is exacerbated if the researcher is looking at a wide variety of possible effects in a single study. If you look at the effects of 50 different chemicals in one experiment, it is almost certain that one of them will give you a significant P result, even if there's really nothing there. Since experiments are long and costly to perform, and scientists much prefer to find a positive result and publish that one, rather than say that their experiments showed that the null hypothesis is actually true, casting a very wide net in studies has become common. And that, because you're testing so many more variables, may lead you to getting a result that is not actually really happening and just subject to random chance. Now, these types of issues are collectively called p-hacking, setting up or modifying your experiment to get a significant p-value result. Over time, these types of bad results will get flushed out as similar experiments are performed and experiments are repeated with different results. But there are movements to try to fight against p-hacking happening in the first place. The one that is making the most headway right now is called the registered report. The idea is that researchers submit their final report before they even do the experiment. They note exactly what their methods will be and what the null hypothesis is and what they are looking for in the data and how it will be processed. Only the actual data collected is left out. The paper is then reviewed and if accepted, the experiment proceeds and the data is filled in after it is collected. If reviewed and approved this way, it is guaranteed to be published in a journal, regardless of the result. This helps prevent researchers sifting through their data to push the statistics to find relations that might not be there, and also will increase the number of null results that are pu uh, published. There is a sad dearth of these, as they are the least flashy type of result, but completely necessary for the advancement of science. And speaking of flashy, you'll often see flashy headlines like women are better at rock, paper, scissors than men. Don't just take those at face value. I implore you to try to look at the actual study. Usually the effect is very slight, like women win 51% of the time and men 49%, and the P factors are, turn out to be very marginal. Newspapers and, honestly, university PR departments often frame studies to be more definitive and attention-getting than they really are. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Tom. 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 Uh, yeah, Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom. Have you ever accidentally eaten one of your game pieces? Do you ever make a fort out of game boxes? How big can a miniature be before it's not really a miniature? And now, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, Tom, which way to the game library? Hey, so as we jump into questions here, first of all, I'm literally out of questions. So Ooh. once again, if you have questions for the show, send them to questions at dicetower.com. We love to answer questions. Send them in. Send us a hard question. Send one that makes Eric go, I don't know. <laughs> Great. That That's not that difficult. All right. So Jay asks us what our thoughts are about friendly local game stores that are able to offer percentage off of their items. Do you find yourself supporting them more than another local store in your area? Most games, he says, cost between $40 and $60. I guess. Uh, <laughs> anyway, these discounts can be very helpful, but it also feels like we're hurting competition. And then we'll get to a second question in a second. Okay. I I guess I'm not understanding this. Okay, I I understand the what people, you know, when they say friendly local game store versus online game store, but he's talking about different friendly local game stores. One offers a percentage off their items; the other does not. Well, I guess, you know, d d different stores are in different geographical areas, may have higher rents, higher overhead. And so the one that's like in the downtown shopping district may not be able to offer those discounts, whereas somebody in a in a less expensive area of town may be able to do that. And is it fair to go always to the one that offers you the, the percentage off as opposed to the one that's in downtown? Okay, I get that, but I don't ever feel bad when there's two local game stores at shopping at one over the other if price point is the only comparable point there. But I don't think it 
I don't know that price point is ever the only thing I would compare. Like here's an example of non-local game stores, Walmart and Target. Right. They have comparable stuff in them to some degree. Not my Walmart. Is this like a bad thing or a good thing? Uh, I, I mean, if you're talking about the game selection? Oh, no, not the game selection. Just just stuff in general. Oh, okay. Yes, similar stuff. Sure. Um, similar stuff, right? But I tend to shop at Target more than I shop at Walmart. Walmart definitely has cheaper prices than Target, although you could argue that the quality of goods in Target is higher. But I think even if it was the same, I would still go to Target because the experience at Target, at least in my area, the experience at Target is much more pleasant than Walmart. In Walmart, people run around and crash. The store always looks like it's falling apart, (laughs) while Target is clean and peaceful and just seems like a better store. I enjoy shopping at Target. I go to Walmart if every other store in the area burns down and I need to go somewhere. Sure. Yes. So so what so taking that to the local game store, if there's two local game stores with and one has a better experience, I will probably go there even if the other store is slightly cheaper. Yeah. If they both give me good at game experiences or in some unfortunate both bad game experiences, I'm going to the cheaper one. Right. And I don't see how that's – that's not me hurting the competition. That's them. True. You know, that's that's just how capitalism works, I guess. Yeah. I, I'm – yeah, I don't want to go off into a rant about, you know, the, the, the needing to support. But I don't know that you need to support anybody unless they give you a reason to support them. And so if a local store – like my local store has my support, I like playing there. I like going there. So I will buy things from them. Mm-hmm. So Makes the sense. second question, Jay says, is with many companies offering upgraded premium components, do you have any games that you would like to see fully upgraded? And then he says, what would Hero Quest look like today? Expensive. Seems like a, well, it looks like a – are you talking about older games that we want to see upgraded? I, I guess. Hero, yeah, I'm not sure if he's can, talking about upgrade like aftermarket upgrades or if he's talking about what would a new version of a classic so sort of like uh survive Escape from Atlantis from the original version to the Stronghold edition. So we want to give somebody a a restoration games treatment maybe, I More guess. More or less, yeah. Uh, stay tuned for our next episode. <laughs> I'd love to see like this, one, this, wait, this one. This one went up, up after the cruise, right? This show. Yes. Uh, well, we're on the cruise. We're technically on a ship right now. We're in international waters, so no one can find us. Got it. Got it. No, I just know there's an announcement being made on the cruise. Oh, that's <laughs> okay, so true. It's our next episode. So look forward to that, folks. Woohoo! But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, because there's something I would have mentioned, but I will mention it later. But it has to do with this question. Wow. What are we talking about? You'll find out. Okay. Uh, Hero Quest is actually the first one that comes to my mind. I would like to see it not just updated components, though, but updated a way to play it. Right. I don't know. I always think of more modern games. Like, I look at Power Grid and say, well, someone please get the paper money out of that game. <laughs> They're coming out with a fifth edition of Power Grid, and I bet you it still has paper money. Probably. It doesn't bother me that much. Yeah, well, it bothers me. Okay. Nicholas asks, I was wondering... If you meet new people at places not related to gaming and get asked, So, Tom, what do you do for a living? What's your answer? I uh, run away. Really? No, I – no, this happens a lot, right? People say, what do you do? And then I say, I'm a reviewer. And then I say, you know, some people review movies because most people know movie reviewers. And then I'll say, I, I do it with board games. And that's the extent of it, usually, but except then they usually go into, wow, that's really cool. That's a great job. Uh, do you play games all day? No, I don't play games all day. What's your favorite game? Well, I'm not going to tell you my favorite game, but I'm going to tell you Ticket to Ride is a great game you should check out. <laughs> I don't say that first part. Actually, I was getting my hair cut. The barber asked me this question. Well, he we started off by saying, do you always dress like this? <laughs> 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 and so I explained that. I often do, yes, and I wear this because I do a video show, and that led it to the thing. Right. And when I told him that I reviewed board games, he got excited, stopped cutting my hair, ran off, and grabbed Miamiopoly. Oh, my. And showed it to me and said, like this? And I was like, yeah, I noticed it's still in shrink. 
He said, oh, I'm going to pop it out of shrink and play it. And then we went to discussion on how most people play the rules of Monopoly wrong. And he didn't know that. You know, he's like, what? Free parking? What do you do when you're not a free yeah. parking? I was like, you, you just, nothing. He's like, well, then why is it there? <laughs> I was like, because it's, it's free parking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we, you know, we talked about that for a while. And, and, and so that happens often. And then people kind of fade away. And then you'll find them come back later and go, you're the board game guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> But I, again, I start with the reviewer thing, and I try not to get too into it. I usually don't volunteer the information. I do find that people volunteer it for me. Hmm. So once someone finds this out, they'll be like, oh, get over here. Hey, do you know what this guy does for a living? Yeah. Like, All right, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I'm not going to be too upset because I do like what I do for a living. I won't argue that. I, so that's what I say. Yeah, I agree. I have, I have an unusual career as well. So uh, the similar thing happens to me. Except Eric's is more legitimate. <laughs> you're saying you're not legitimate? It's a legitimate. No, I know, but yours is one that people will be like, oh. Now, I bet you, though, when, pe- when you tell this to people, they always ask, like, what books you've read. Right. Like, desperately looking for one they know. Yes. But if they don't do sci-fi or – you do a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, right? I do. I've done all all genres. There's I can name off a few like big authors that I've done their work and usually that like Kurt Vonnegut or, or something. Um, I, I've done some Heinlein. So I, I can name some big authors that they'll recognize and, and sort of go, oh, yeah, I know that. It's always their you know second tier stuff, but still. Wait, you do some what? They're – Second tier, like usually not their big hit, but I'll do the. So I did, um, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Ken Kesey. Yeah, I did the book he did after that. I... <laughs> you sound like the guy, like, well, you know, this famous person. I was with their cousin. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like that. All right, Edward says, uh, we, this is uh, continuing our very long running conversation about subscription box lines. And he said there is an existing subscription box line that delivers a single alternate miniature each month from Perfetier Press called the Mini Crate. Hmm. And it's for their game War Machine hordes. So it's an alternative miniature to something that already exists. And it's there just for collector and painting purposes. And you, But you can legally use them in the game. And it's doing really well for them, apparently. Huh. So that's cool. If I was a miniatures painter, that's something I would not mind. Because I think that's a little more focused. You're getting a miniature for a game you like. Right. You're not getting a random game. Right. That's all. Yeah. Well, I mean, this came from the question that somebody asked if, if a, a subscription box for minis would work. And and we had said, I think we said something similar, that it, we wouldn't want to just get a random mini for a random game. But if we could subscribe to a particular game system, like this War Machine Hordes system... And get a mini for that. So I know I like this game, and now I get something I can use for that game. That makes sense. But how many games How many games does that make sense for? Mm, miniature games, really. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, uh, how many mini systems are... I guess if it's, if it's big enough to support content coming out for it every month, then it's probably big enough to support some sort of subscription service for a mini every month or two months or whatever. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So Mike is going on a retreat with extended family. They're all going to be together in the same house or cabin. And he's bringing more than enough games that everyone likes. But a few people insist that he brings the talking game with that mouth-expanding device. It, it, there are several of these. They come in different names. I received the game from the same relative a few years ago. So the one that is asking him to bring it. But looking at open mouths and teeth makes me gag to the point that even listening to someone talk makes me want to gag. I have already said that I would bring the game, though, and I have told this relative about my gagging and said I would have to leave if they started playing the game. The question is, do I have a right to feel hurt if they actually play the game anyway? It would basically cut down game time. I'm the hardcore gamer in the family and don't get to play games that often as it is and also leave me feeling left out of the family during our retreat. Again, I have more than enough other games that they like to play as it is. Why can't we just play games that everyone likes to play? I always think about other people's feelings and tastes for games when I organize a game night and choose games to play. I think he's got to suck it up and let them play the game. 
Uh, this question, I, I, again, I can't read the tone it was written in. It, just, <laughs> it, it sounds a little whining almost in a sense. Uh, I, I'm not if, – if, if this game makes you want to gag, I'm not a fan of this game at all. But it – or these – you know, whatever the versions are, speak out and – Right. I think it's a waste of, of space, this game. But but some people really enjoy them. If it makes you gag, it makes you gag, then you have to leave. Yeah. It's also a pretty short but game. I, like, it can be one yeah. of many games you play on this weekend. And, you know, maybe you yeah, you help make so. dinner or lunch or something while they're playing that game. I'm going to go to the kitchen and make some sandwiches for everybody. Or I'm going to go play with the kids outside or something. You know, some other activity. I'm going to go for a walk while you guys play that game. That's fine. I do find it interesting that he said here... That- I'm bringing enough games that everyone likes, but a few people insisted I bring that talking game with that mouth expanding device. Um, I if 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 you really feel strongly about this, I would have that game not show up. <laughs> Oops, I must have. I thought I had packed it. Oh, darn. Well, I'm not saying to lie like Eric did. I might just say oh, I didn't bring that game because it makes me gag. Oh, you wanted to play it? Well, you're you're welcome to bring a copy. Yeah. Yeah. Type. It feels like the easiest way to deal with the situation. <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess. All right. Aaron says, you both spend a fair amount of time playing, rating, reviewing, and ranking games. I've been wondering how reviewers decide when they're ready to review or rate a game. What all goes into this decision, and how do you know you're experienced a game enough to review or rate it? Do you have a rule of thumb for the number of times you play a game before doing so, or do you attempt to play the game with various player counts? And then he gives an example where he plays a game that he loves and then played another game, but he loved it even more, but he didn't even finish a whole game of it. And he just thinks it's too quick to make the judgment that this second game is better than the first one. And so there's a lot of factors that come into play, he says. He says, I realize there might be a lot of factors that come into play, but I'm just curious in your approach and thoughts on this. And I think you just summed it up yourself there. Uh, Aaron was saying that there's a lot of factors that come into play. Yeah. I have never in my life played a kid's game, say Haba or any of those kid's games, that after about five minutes in, my opinion on that game was solidified forever. (laughs) Yep. And nothing will ever change that because it is what it is. Yeah. There's – I don't need to see – the 17th match turned over to know what a memory match game is going to do. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, I guess there's some exceptions to that. You know, there's some games that are more in depth, like let's say stuff fables. Yeah. Right. But, but for the most part, a lot, there's all, there's a lot of games and it's not just kids games, but party games. There's a lot of games you can, you can know right away. And then as you get more and more experienced, you tend to know, what a game will do. Not always. There are games that will surprise you. And there are games that I've started out loving the game and then realized the flaw in the game, or at least a flaw for me and, and disliked it or, you know, the opposite, but it's, it's so different for every game that I, I can't even give it to you. I can just say it's a gut feeling. You'll find many people on the internet who say that my gut feelings are so erroneous that I shouldn't be allowed to review games. That's reasonable, but Yeah. Eric is probably more scientific than me. Uh, not really. I mean, I tend to, uh, oddly enough, I, I often want to play a game I didn't enjoy again to make sure that that impression is is solid. You know, did, it did, would I really have such a terrible experience here? Um, I just want to make sure I got it right uh, before I, I say anything negative about it. Um, but I tend to be more enthusiastic immediately. And, and it's, you know, ratings change uh, as time goes by, as you have other context, as other games fall into place. All we can do as reviewers is talk about our experiences now um, and, and how we're feeling about these games now after the plays we've been able to play. And um, while that can change in the future, right now it is what it is, and this is our reaction to the game. Yeah, that makes sense. Rebecca writes in to say, My brother and I have fallen completely in love with the hobby. Board games were part of our childhood growing up, and over the past three years, we have both built pretty admirable board game collections. With that being said, I think we are both looking for more. 
At this point, I think it is fair to call ourselves hopeful game designers who are even possibly interested in publishing games. But right now, we really want to connect more with the board gaming community. We live in Ohio and have been going to Origins. I have been to Origins twice already, but we are looking for more. What advice do you have for us? Is there a good place to start? I've thought about starting a blog or even a YouTube channel, but the process of really starting these efforts is a bit uncertain to me. As one of the best and most well-known content creators, any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. Indianapolis is a short drive. <laughs> um. So, if you're a designer and you want to publish games, well, I'm always very. I always warn people. You say you're a hopeful game designer, and you're possibly interested in publishing games. It's not a possible thing here. What do you want to do? Do you want to design or do you want to publish? Because you're going to end up doing one of those things more than the other. But a good place to start, maybe Gen Con. But I think the best way to start is to just start designing games. Go to some of these、uh, design conventions and、yeah. Proto Spiel and stuff like that. Play a lot of other people's games so that you know what you're doing. I mean, it sounds like you're doing that anyway, and then start. Showing your game off to different publishers.、Uh, eventually, if your game's good enough, someone will pick it up. You want to schedule these appointments ahead of time. It's not easy. I guarantee you that. It's a hard row. Publishers who have many, many published games can't get some of their games published. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough row to hoe, but it's definitely not an impossibility. It, planning helps out a lot. And networking, I cannot emphasize the importance of networking. Yeah, you go and you demo for people and help people at their booths and get involved in the industry. You do that enough, people know who you are. They'll take a look at your game.、Uh, I think、uh, looking into the unpub community, the proto spiel community, that they, that's, that's a section of the hobby that I'm really not involved in, so I can't speak firsthand. But I know that if you're looking to design and develop. And get feedback on your games. You want to be in that sphere. And what's the? We've given out a, a link before in the past. The board game design forum. Is that correct? There's a web web forum that that is yeah, a community. Yeah, but I don't know how、guys. I don't know how popular that is now. Now I think a lot of the design stuff has、uh, come into Facebook.、Mm. I think there's a lot of Facebook stuff. Okay. That、uh, like design groups and things, but I wouldn't be able to tell you which ones. You're probably better off, you know, hunting that down yourself. But attending an unpub convention would not be a bad idea to just immerse yourself in that world, get feedback on your designs, or even just see the process of giving feedback to other designers for their designs, and just see how it all works. You say you're you're still new and how to get your toe into this. I think that's not a bad path. Alrighty, well, thanks for those questions, folks. Remember to send us questions at questions at dicetower dot com. Send them on in. Meanwhile, let's jump back in time. Activate interlocks. Wait, that's Voltron. Never mind. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice tower's top ten list is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc. Cool Stuff Inc. Cool Stuff. In stock at CoolStuffInc. dot com. Okay, so we go back a decade in the time, two thousand and nine. It's really weird sometimes to think how Y two K is almost twenty years ago. Oh my goodness! I've been telling my my children that story, and they think it's hilarious that you know the computers didn't know what date it was, and it like it's like this fable, this fairy tale that I get to tell. <laughs> and it's yes, this really happened. Well, no, I just read on the internet somewhere that someone basically said that as of now there are no miners alive who were born in the twentieth century. Yeah, yeah. Every child right now has been born in the twenty-first century. That's so. Yep. Anyhow, okay. Yeah, we'll get off this old man kick here. <laughs> so, top ten games from two thousand nine. So, two thousand nine was a pretty good year for gaming. I wouldn't put it. Amongst the best years for new board games, some great games came out that year. But my one through five on my list, I like. Like my, I, I, it's hard to explain. Like I don't, I had to. It wasn't like oh, there's ten amazing games 
all my games are very good, but it wasn't like it was that easy to put it together hmm. compared to last week's 2014, where I could have gone up to like 50. <laughs> yes, that's true. I think for, 2014 was a a stronger year overall. Um, I mean, there's some great games here, and this one still holds a, a a place in my heart just because this is when I really dove into the hobby. Um, I was playing the games before 2009, but this was my first big convention attendance, and it's when I joined the show as co-host. So it was really, you know, diving in with both feet. This is amazing to me that you've been a co-host of the show for 10 years. Yeah, August is going to be my 10-year anniversary. I that I sh- shed co-host. Oh, uh, don't you get to 10-year when you're 10? A 10-year? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what happens. You can't get rid of me then. Hmm. But I have some time. <laughs> it sounds like the plot for a really bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, he's trying to get you out. We got to stop him. Gather the kids. <laughs> um, 2009... I had not yet come to America in 2009. I was still in Korea at this point in time, but I was preparing to come to America. I came in 2010. 2009 was my first Essen ever. Right. So I went to Essen Spiel for the first time. I remember that because several of the games here I saw at Essen for the first time. The hobby was a very different place. Asmodee did not run everything. Yeah. Uh, You know, we mentioned five years ago that they had bought Fantasy Flight. Ten years ago, uh, the the biggest thing was Days of Wonder. You know, they were they were sitting really pretty mm. ten years ago. Uh, they were they were flush off the success of Ticket to Ride. They had some pretty big games come out this year. And one of the things from two thousand nine is the uh, the uh, expansions. There were so many good expansions. The expansion for Kingsburg, which I'll never play without. Memoir expansions were showing up everywhere. The ghost stories. This was the year that the Dominion expansions began. Dominion was still really strong in 2009. Well, many people were just still so figuring that out, too. I mean, it was it was still new enough that Dominion Intrigue, which premiered in 2009, was, was still the, – the wave was still growing for Dominion. Right, I think Seaside also came out in 2009. Yep, yep. There was just there was a lot of really strong expansions. So it was a really good year. I enjoyed it uh quite a bit. Obviously, I was still getting in the games and everything. Uh I, I was a, was I still No, I was start, I was doing video reviews, but I was still known for my written reviews at this point. When I went to Essen, I think I had like six people say hi to me. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, interesting enough, I believe Board Game Geek was doing their video things for board games even 10 years ago, weren't they? I think, I think so, yeah. Wow, it's so weird to go back. And, and it just video's been around for a while now. But anyhow, uh, let's stop this nostalgic stuff. Let's start talking about the games. Number 10. We're going to kick off the list with a, a joint selection. Our number 10 is Tales of the Arabian Nights. The first time I played this was at Origins with the Engelstein family. And if you've ever hung out with the Engelstein family, you know how much fun it would be to play Tales of the Arabian Nights with, like, Sidney and Brian Engelstein. That, I mean, that that was a blast. And... um. It's it's one that slid a little bit in years uh, that that have gone by, just because there are other storytelling games that I've played more often. But the zaniness that can happen in a Tales of the Arabian Nights adventure uh, is is well worth some great memories. So that's why it's my number ten. How about you, Tom? Yeah, that is, just so people might wonder, this game originally came out in 1985. Uh, that was the first edition, and Z-Man did this second edition. And I remember Zev handing me the box, and I was like, why is this thing so heavy? So heavy. And it was because the book inside was heavy. And yes, Eric's right. It's super zany. It was my number five. It's dropped a 10. It dropped much farther for you, Eric. But it's just because there's so many good storytelling games. When when this first came out, we we were struggling to get a a good storytelling game. Now, throw a rock and you'll hit some. (laughs) There's so many great ones. But no storytelling game has yet reached the insanity that Tales of Arabian Nights had, where you know at one point, you know you you start beating somebody and they turn out to be a wizard and they change your gender 
and then you find someone who you fall in love with and they start chasing you <laughs> around the board and then you get captured by an evil genie. There's like evil genies up the wazoo. All in this over game. the place, yeah. Oh, it's insane how many evil genies there are. And it's just – it's one insane thing after another and there's like negative statuses. And normally this stuff would really bother me. Like oh, yeah. you're crippled and insane and hunt it. And I'd be like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I do find it interesting though. This is you know 10 years old now. We were promised from Z-Man – more games in this series, Tales of the Arthurian Legends we had heard about. We had heard about some space version. We never saw any of those games. Yeah, don't worry. I'm not complaining and, 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 and upset about that. Uh, I would actually be kind of annoyed about it. But the fact is, is that, again, we have so many of these storytelling games. Yeah. Number nine. Moving on to number nine, I picked Egizia. Uh, this is a, a worker a selection game, worker placement game that uses a river mechanism where you can place farther up the river and get some of the you know lesser things. But if you really want to get the stuff you want farther down the river, you have to skip ahead. But once once you place it a certain point on the river, you can no longer place anywhere up river of where you were. So there's this jockeying and and do I skip ahead? But then I've reduced my options for later. Um, it's a mechanism that's been used in a lot of other games since then, but uh, this is the first time I experienced it. And uh, it's a neat worker placement game. Egizia, number nine. Do you know I've never played this? Yeah, it's not bad. You can play it online, but I know how much you like playing games online. Well, again, I'm not actually even opposed to playing games online. I want to clarify that. It's just that time. Sure. I got to pick time to do things. Uh, my number nine is Adventurers Temples of Shock. Well, now, this game fascinates me because, again, I look back in time at these things, and this means this game came out 10 years ago, which means AEG was just dabbling in the board games mm -hmm. because that's who published this game back in the day, and they had some pretty bad board games to start out with. <laughs> and so when this one came out, I was like, oh, this one's actually pretty fun. Mm. And they were still not sure whether they want to get into board games. Now I believe that's pretty much all they do. True. And this one was Indiana Jones, the board game. It really was. I will be the first to admit there's some flaws to this game. And there's definitely, if you get squished by those walls, you're trying. <laughs> but the boulder is there. The lava is there. The bridge and the river that you can fall to your doom are there. Great pieces. The whole thing is just a joy. I like it a lot. I still have my painted version. It's in the Dice Tower Library. Mm. Lots of fun. Adventurers Temple of Shock. Yes, this this made my short list for sure, and it made my adventure list just a few weeks ago. It's a it's a neat looking game for sure. Number eight. Number eight is one of the all time favorite party games in my family. That's Telestrations. Uh, this one is constantly requested by the family. You you've got a a card that has a phrase on it, you then need to draw that phrase, then pass that drawing to the next person, and they look at it and try and figure out what you meant by that. It is extremely entertaining to play with an eight-year-old because you end up with very interesting drawings. Um, when my son tried to draw a house sitter, I got a very interesting picture. Anyway, Telestrations, my number eight. I'm trying to imagine that. That's interesting. Mm. Yeah, Telestration was on my short list. Really, really enjoy that one. My number eight, though, is Heartland, which actually 10 years, well, nine years later, I guess. I wonder why they didn't wait for the 10-year thing. Speaking of that, as a quick a side note here, as I like to rabbit trail, I've been looking at these games and wondering which of these we're going to see a 10th anniversary edition show. True, yeah, yeah, who knows? There's one I know for sure, I think, and we'll, I'll, I'll mention that when we get to it. Okay. But, and there's some guesses I have. Anyway, Heartland was remade as Gunkamono mm. uh, from uh, Renegade did it. But the original game, which I believe might have only come out in Europe, about farming, it looked boring as all get out. I was like, this isn't that interesting. But making groups of these areas in a farm and then cutting up, carving up other people so they couldn't get points, it's so fun and so mean. I like it a lot. 
Uh, but you can probably just hunt down Kukumono instead nowadays. That's Heartland. <laughs> number seven. My number seven is going to show up on Tom's list in a bit. Uh, so I really don't know what I should do right now other than just put my entire hand in my magic pile. That's a bad decision. My number seven is not on Eric's list. It was number three last time, and I still like this one a lot, and that's Small World. Now, this is one I don't think they'll make a 10th edition of. Days of Wonder tends to make 10th editions of their games. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they made a deluxe edition that is like the deluxiest of all deluxe editions yeah. of any game. What would they do for a 10th anniversary? I know. It's like anything they make would be like garbage <laughs> <laughs> compared to that one. The only problem with their super deluxe version is it's in this chest that you have to like carry with those two handles. Oh. I hate that there's not a handle on top. Huh. I want to just carry the game. Anyhow, uh, Small World, which was a follow-up to a game that came 10 years before that, mm. Vinci, yep. when that game came out in 1999. Uh, but Small World did it in such a better way. They teased Small World for a long time, Days of Wonder. We were like, what is this? They had these cards with a big footprint on it. They're like, something big is coming. It's like, what? What are you talking about? And then it's Small World. Ha ha. You get the the joke there. We said something big, and yeah. it's called Small World. Uh -huh. and like, Shut up. Yep. But it was such a fun game. Yep. And it's one of their best sellers, actually, to this day. So my number th seven, Small World. Yeah, this was number 11. I just bumped it off the list as I was putting it all together. Uh, it, it's, it's a good one. I was a fan of Vinci to begin with, and so I was sort of like, ah, we don't need a new version of this. And then I played it, and yes, it's, it's very well done. It's very pretty. Anyway, number six. My number six is Burger Joint. Uh, it's a Rio Grande two-player game, and uh, it's about, about running a pizza stand or a burger stand. It's really a, a cube allocation game. It's a cube drafting game, and you're using these different colored cubes to make various restaurants that have powers and, and can give you priority over certain cubes. And you're trying to get the cubes that you need, but also the ones that your opponent wants to get first as you draft them each round. Um, my kids have enjoyed playing this when it's it's hit the table recently uh, a good number of times, and so it's it's still still one that's at the top of my list. Burger Joint, my number six. Yeah, all right. My number six is the Resistance. Have you still not played this? Oh no, I played it. Uh, it just this one never really connected for me. Well, there's not a lot I can say. Resistance was. Resistance is solely, I say, responsible for the last 10 years of there being 10 million social deduction games. Probably, yeah. Because Werewolf existed for, and Mafia has been existed for years, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But Resistance, people are like, what? This is like Werewolf, but different? And it was played over and over again. In fact, I think I played this with Eric in, 1990, in 2009 at Total Con. I believe that's the case, yes. And then I went out and bought a copy, and then it just never hit the table again. So, Wow. We went to TotalCon in 2009, didn't we? Wait, I, or was it 2010? It must have been 2010. It must have been because, yes. So anyhow, well, interesting. All right. So that is The Resistance, my number six. It was also six last time. Yeah. I'm staying consistent. Number five. Speaking of consistency, this was my number five uh, when we did this five years ago. That's Homesteaders. We talked about uh, the, the early games of AEG. This was one of the early games of Tasty Minstrel Games. Uh, and, and one that the first edition of had some flaws. I think they learned some lessons in the first printing of Homesteaders. But it was good enough to have another printing. Homesteaders is an auction and resource management game. You're, you're getting various buildings that then can be triggered by resources and putting workers on them. Um, there's a lot going on, and, and it's got adorable little um, apple meeples and cow meeples and, and resource pieces. Uh, it, it has it's, it's a nice, solid system um, and, and moves at a pretty good clip. So I was happy to see Homesteaders stay alive in future editions, and it's still my number five. Yeah, this, uh, this game is the one, I think, that there is a 10th edition coming out. Hmm. Because it wasn't a very nice production. Well, it wasn't awful. But they, there were some problems with it. A nice version of it, I believe, has been kickstarted or is coming out. One of those two. Cool. My number five was number eight. It's actually gone up for me. And I'm like really jonesing to get this one to the table. And that's Shipyard. 
And that's because this designer is just super hot for me these days, and that's Vladimir Suchi. Shipyard is the game. Mm. Nowadays, of course, for uh, Underwater Cities is all the rage, and of course, Pulsar 2849. But Shipyard, which is a rondel within rondels game. There's one giant rondel, and then there are several side rondels as you're just working to get this big ship built and then move it down the river and score points for the different pieces of the ship. It's great. I love it. Shipyard, my number five. Hmm. Number four. My number four was my number four last time as well. That's Thunderstone, the original. Now, uh, there's been two more revisions to the system uh, since then. But at the time, this was sort of the, the new deck building adventure. More than just building the deck, it's actually doing something with it and going on adventures and fighting monsters and leveling up your characters. There was a lot of possibility in that first box and then tons of expansions adding more characters and classes and all sorts of weapons and monsters. And, uh, the system was still solid, even though they revised it and, and made changes to it. It, it, it worked. And uh, in the original version of Thunderstone, if you find an old copy of it, it's still, it's still a very fun game. And uh, you could play it Tom's way, where he mixes all the cards together, or you could play it by the rules. Um, it, it's still a great game, and I'm surprised it well, it's fallen off your a, list. Hey, that's there. in the rules now, Eric. I I mean the the original rules. Anyway, oh well, that's well. Th- again, that's the reason it's off my list. I like <laughs> Thunderstone; it was fun, but Thunderstone Quest is so different than Thunderstone that I will never play Thunderstone again. It was good, but it's been replaced. Okay. Thunderstone Quest is just that much better. My number four was not on my list last time, and I think it's just because it's a game that probably almost made my list, and now I like it more. Uh, and I, I don't know. That's just Dice Town. Mm. They just recently have republished Dice Town with a new expansion, the Cowboys for it and stuff. I don't know what it is about Dice Town. It's one of those favorites that's going to get pulled out somewhere along the line. Uh, some new people will be like, oh, do you got a game I can play? I'm like, oh, you'll like this game. You get to roll dice <laughs> and make poker hands. So if they like poker hands and stuff like that, Dice Town works really well. It's a fun Western style game. The new version's really cool. That's my number four, Dice Town. Yeah, that's this is one that just never clicked for me. I guess I must not like poker hands. Number three. Number three was my number ten when we did this list last time, and that's Hansa Teutonica. I like the engine building, making your your actions more uh more efficient. You've got that sort of drawer desk space board and you're you're making your actions better and claiming areas on the board. It, it, the whole thing just clicks for me. Uh, one I haven't played in a while, but one that has certainly moved up in my estimation from 2009. That's Hansa Teutonica, my number three. Yeah, I like, I like Hansa Teutonica fine. It's uh, not as much as Eric. And, and nowadays I wonder if I like it as much because their theme really isn't there. Mm. Um, I thought they were making a sequel to this. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I thought they were for sure. Anyway, my number three is another Western theme game. Dice Town was my number four. Uh, this was number four last time. It moved up slightly. And that's Carson City. This is one of my favorite worker placement games. It's big. It's grandiose. I remember going to Essen that year and everyone was playing Carson City. And it's a worker placement game where you can even fight each other and kick each other off the different worker placement uh, spots with uh, d- d- by dueling them. And I think this game has moved up because a few years later they released uh, like a really deluxe version quitted games that I ju- that was just super fun. Hmm. So a lot of great fun for me. Carson City, my number three. Cool. Number two. My number two is another one that's moved up on the list. Uh, it was number nine before. That's Valdora. This is a pick up and deliver game uh, that that has you. You've got these books. Uh, it's actually a deck of cards that sits on a, an easel sort of thing, and you're, you're actually flipping pages that give you things to buy, tools and uh, extra backpacks and stuff like that. And you're moving around the board trying to deliver certain crystals to certain locations. It is a, a pretty straightforward pick-up-and-deliver game, but I like leveling up your character and buying equipment that help you help you do what you're trying to do. And it's one that I have to admit has been on my my trade or, or sell pile. And then I look at it again. I'm like, I, I can't get rid of that. I still really like that game. Um, and I just haven't been able to let it go because it, it's so fun. Valdora, number two. 
Wow, that's really weird to me. It's that high in your list. I like Valdora fine, but you are kind of a sucker for pickup and delivery. I'm a sucker. You're right. My number two is Cichlades, which wasn't on the list at all last time. I like Cichlades fine, but the expansion Titans make Cichlades amazing. So I don't even know if this one's really fair to put on a list because it has an expansion that came out like six, seven years later. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it makes the game that much more fun. Easily my number two, Cichlades. I like the French pronunciation, Cyclade. And finally, number one. My number one is a revision of Age of Steam. This is Steam. Uh, it was my number three uh, last time we did this. For a long time, I was a, a staunch supporter of Age of Steam over Steam, but I, I've come to really embrace the distilled nature of Steam. They, they sort of streamlined it. They made it a little more accessible, but it still has the crunchiness of Age of Steam and, and is a, a really solid uh, revision of the system. And plus, there's lots of expansion maps that often work for both versions of, of the system. It, it's, it's a success for sure. And the strongest game, in my estimation, of 2009, Steam. Huh. I, you know, I wouldn't have expected this one to be so strong on your list still. So you, you have no, like, desire to go to the other ones. This one is the best of the lot for you? Uh, I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I just saw that they've announced uh, Railways of... Portugal, I think, is being designed by oh, um, Vit Vitel Lacerda. Oh, interesting. I, I should yeah, note I know. That, it, that I don't own Steam. I own Railways of the World um, just because I, I can't own them all. Huh. It's what, so it's not Pokemon then, huh? I, no, I don't want to catch them all. My number one was Eric's number seven. Mm -hmm. And this is the one I think, I suspect, if they're going to announce a 10th anniversary edition, it's going to happen this year. Mm. And that's Summoner Wars. Doesn't it feel like they could? I, I think they probably could. I'd love to see an art um, revamp. I'd love to see um, Fernanda Suarez do the art for... Um... Oh, that would be... With all due respect to the person who did the art before, I never disliked it, but she's amazing. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like the graphic design overlay. Bring Summoner Wars back. Bring Summoner Wars back. <laughs> this is a great game. It's one of my favorites. Uh, this uh, And this kind of put Plat Hat on the map. This sure. was our first game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I loved it. Still really like it. So that is Summoner Wars, my number one. Yeah. And Eric likes it too, which is a good combo. I, I do. I do like it as well. It's it, Yeah, it's... It is the game that got them going and and really, you know, it had tons of expansions. That game had legs for sure uh, and and a lot of neat ways to play. It played quickly. It had uh, the different factions felt different. Um, it was it was a really neat game. I, I would I would be very excited to see a 10th anniversary uh, like graphical revamp, maybe version, maybe anyway. Yeah, I think that's what you'll see on the list. I'm, I'm looking over these different games. I think you'll see a 10th anniversary of of that one. That's probably the only one, actually. But we'll see. Hmm. All right, People's Choice. Number 10, they said Steam. Yep. Matching Eric's number one. Number nine, At the Gates of Lo Yang. This oft... This one was, I was surprised to see here. This is like the redheaded stepchild of the... Uwe Rosenberg. Uh, Uwe Rosenberg games. I was so excited. I went to S and I'm like... I'm getting the new Uwe Rosenberg game. <laughs> the last two were Agricola and La Havre. What's this one? It's about farming. Uh, okay, that's what they're all about. Yay. Oh, it's complicated, and it's different than the other ones. Oh, I'm not as excited. Oh, <laughs> oh. I was so sad. Number eight is Summoner Wars. Number seven, Tobago, which is a cool game. Yep. But Cryptid kind of has beat it down. It has. Number six is Dominion Intrigue, which is a base set of Dominion, but it was the first expansion. Right. Five is Castle Panic. Oh, you know what? I This one we might see a 10th anniversary of. Yeah, Although, maybe. They just announced my first Castle Panic. Did you hear about that? I did hear about that, and I've, I've heard some discussion on the subject. Uh, Castle Panic is pretty streamlined and basic to begin with, so I'm, I'm worried about how basic they're going to make it. I have a four-year-old. We'll see what happens. I think your kids are probably too old for that. Could at this be, point. yeah. Number four is Telestrations. Number three is The Resistance. Uh, number two is Jaipur, mm. which was on my short list. Okay. 
This one has had a resurgence. A lot of people like it because it's a really solid two-player trading style game. Right. And number one, easily, Small World. Mm. So like I said, not an amazing year per se, but that's only because we're comparing it to modern years. I've gone back to 1999, and the past is grim. So, <laughs> Yeah, we should be getting uh, to that in a few weeks, in about a month, well, I guess. I already have my 2019 list started. Number one, Wingspan. Number two, New Frontiers. Those are the only two 2019 games I've played. Great. I've got zero, well, I guess, technically, Comanauts comes out in 2019, so I've played one game. Oh, okay, Comanauts is my number three. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually keeping a list now. For the first time ever, I decided to I'm going to start a running list of all the games that I play, mm. and I'm going to mark down notes so that at the end of the year, when I make my top ten games of this or that, I don't have to do as much heavy lifting. That's not a bad idea, and I could start doing that now. You could, because we are, as of recording this, just a couple days into the year. Yeah, what a great idea. It's not like it's original or anything. For once, you've had a good idea, Tom. Oh, thank you, sir. All righty, folks. Well, once again, if you want to check out our Kickstarter, remember it's starting on the 21st at noon. Check out DiceTower.com. We'll have more information there. Either way, we really appreciate you listening to the show. We'll see you guys in a week. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 589, was recorded on January 3rd, 2019. Next week, it's time for a floating podcast as Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and I assemble for a live roundtable from the Dice Tower Cruise. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, Roy Kennedy, and Rob Searing. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Our hasty replacement when Mr. Vassell's lavalier goes on the fritz provided by sub a Tom Mike. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at Dicetower at gmail.com, or follow us on Facebook. And, of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including Board Gamers Anonymous, The Snakes Cast, Rolling Dice and Taking Names, The Geek All-Stars, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, The Dukes of Dice, Our Turn, and Board Game Breakfast at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Yeah, future Tom and future Eric are on a ship right now. Future Eric is consistently correcting me. I heard him again last week. I'm gonna, if he's on that ship, I'm going to talk to him. Hey, future Eric here. He missed me. <laughs>